Let's see if we can't get this thing running right. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Today, we're gonna to be taking a second look at the Inwin RS212 chassis. If you wanna click right up here to see the first part of that review, go right ahead. But we didn't get to get to any acoustic or performance testing on this box because honestly, I used the wrong coolers. The only coolers I had on hand for this build were a set of 1U passive copper blocks from Silverstone. And unfortunately, being 1U, they didn't have nearly enough airflow in this chassis to cool them properly. So to finish this build off, I went ahead and jumped on the Amazon and bought myself a pair of Supermicro SNK P0048AP4 active 2U coolers. These should do a much better job than the 1U passive units I was using. However, these are gonna come at the cost of noise. Now, again, this chassis is kind of aimed towards data centers, so I'm not gonna hold that against these, but these are going to be loud fans. These again are 2U tall active CPU coolers, which means they do have a dedicated fan to blow air through them, rather than relying on air from the chassis fans inside of the server case. These are 2011 mount heatsinks, and the reason I bought these particular ones was these will actually mount to both the square ILM and the narrow ILM, which is kind of rare to see in a server heatsink. There's a pretty loose mesh of aluminum fins inside of there, as well as two heat pipes contacting the cold plate, but I'm actually expecting some pretty decent performance out of these. So let's go ahead and get them installed and finally get this server powered up. So mission accomplished. Although as you can hear, it's not nearly as quiet as I would still like it to be. Uh, but it's not obscenely loud. Uh, honestly, this is no louder than one of the switches that's in my network closet right now. Uh, if you had a room to isolate this in, it could totally be a home server. It's not the screeching banshee that I was fearing it would be. Still too loud to run in the same room while I'm filming though. So I'm gonna go and get an operating system installed, run a couple of benchmark tests on here for temperatures for both the hard drives and for the CPUs, and we'll uh, just come back and recap in a minute. All right, we are finally all booted up. Let's go ahead and get inside and let's do some testing. Idle temps are sitting right around 50 degrees Celsius, so 50 for the rear CPU and 47 for the CPU, a little bit further forward and closer to the chassis fans. And that's pretty much what I would expect for this box. But let's see how she handles under load. Do you understand now why I said the server was aimed at data centers? Go ahead and kill that. And the nice thing about servers like this is they have a pretty massive amount of airflow. And so the CPU temps typically recover quite quickly. As you can see, we're already back down to 51 on the front CPU. We're hovering right around 57 on the rear. Those will come back down here in just another minute or so. But the fans have already recovered back down to their middle state. Uh, Overall, pretty impressive. It was able to keep all 16 cores and 32 threads uh, under 95 degrees Celsius. And honestly, in a 2U chassis, I'd call that a win. Before we close here, I'm gonna go and run one more test just to show you how impressive running the server below 95 degrees Celsius is, and that's power draw. There is a lot of power running through these two chips. They are 135 watts each under full tilt. So I'm gonna go and show you how much power this is drawing in real time to give you an idea of how good of a job these two CPU heatsinks and the server in general is doing. So even at idle, this box is drawing about 140 watts of power. And that's kind of crazy because my entire server stack with a load on it only draws about 250. And that's running two servers, a network switch and a backup unit. Yeah, 145, 140, 146, 
somewhere right in that neighborhood. So let's go ahead and apply a full load to these CPUs. We're gonna hit 500. We're gonna be close. We're gonna be really close. So there's our high. Our high is 497 watts. And I can tell you that's pretty much what it's sustaining is right in that 485, yeah, 470, 469. That's where it's hovering right now under full tilt. And as you can see, temperatures are sitting right in that 95 degree range on the rear CPU and about 89 degrees on the front CPU. That's actually pretty darn good for what we're working with in here. Another metric really quick is the drive temperature. Now the drives really don't heat up under a larger load. Uh, they're pretty much what they are, especially with the spinning disks. They don't get hotter as they generate more data. It's really negligible when you're putting a load on the drives. Uh, but as you can see, the 14 terabyte Seagate drives are sitting at 27 degrees each and the SSDs are sitting at 23 degrees. Now I will say the ambient temperature in my room right now is 22. So as far as drive cooling, an incredibly efficient chassis, keeping these just above ambient temperature. And as far as the CPUs, this is pretty much a worst case scenario for this chassis. Remember, this only has 550 watt power supplies. So yeah, 497 watts for a peak. Honestly, very, very impressive for this chassis. Really stretched to the limit of what these power supplies and honestly what this chassis could probably handle. I know this was a little bit of a shorter video, but I did want to double back on the Inwin RS212 and just give a little bit of an idea for what temperature performance you can expect and honestly what acoustic performance you can expect. This is not a home lab enthusiast chassis. This is a bona fide data center box and the acoustics and the thermals kind of bear that out. All in all, it is a great 2U chassis and a box that I wouldn't be ashamed to put in one of the data centers that I manage. Uh, great box, great performance, very easily assembly, uses off the shelf parts. Uh, if you do wanna build one of these, links will be down in the video description. Go check them out. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. I do have one more video coming out with this system and that is RAID configurations. What are they and why should you use them? So stay tuned next week for that episode. Make sure to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't like it, and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing, and if you'd like to financially back the channel, there are a couple different ways you can do so. Follow the Amazon affiliate links down in the video description, or click on my Amazon store to find whatever you need for your next build or upgrade. Or you can join my Patreon. A $1 donation gets you access to my exclusive Discord server. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers all. Really sorry that one's gone now. As excited as I am to get the server running properly, I'm even more excited for today's beer. It's a special one. Uh, out of Crux Brewing, this is the Double Cross Dark Belgian Style Ale. It clocks in at 11% and 20 IBU. Now I am a sucker for a good Belgian, but even more so, I'm a sucker for a good dark Belgian. A vibrant reddish black hue, substantial body, and pleasant headiness give the dark Belgian style ale an alluring first impression. The intense flavors of dark candy sugar conspire to deceive with flavors that remind us of preserved fruits and holiday spicing. But the true agent is the Trappist yeast and a suspicious drinkability. Crux Fermentation Project in Bend, Oregon. You can smell that Belgian like banana and clove flavor right on the nose of this beer. Uh, very malty and almost reminds me of a, uh, of a nice English red ale. Oh, that is good. And that does not taste like 11%. This tastes like a 6% red ale with like Belgian inspired flavors. Ooh, this, this one's dangerous. I'm trying to think of how to explain the spices in this beer because it's not like an allspice or a nutmeg or like a savory spice like that. It's actually got a little bit of a of a heat to it. It's it's not peppery, but it's it's kind of a mix between like a pumpkin pie and a cayenne pepper. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's super dangerous. <laughs> you know what this beer is? This is taking three of my favorite styles of beers and combining all of the best aspects into one. This is like the best of a Belgian white mixed with an English red mixed with some English style bitters. It, absolutely fantastic. The The malty notes on here are just delicious. And the, the spice, like I said, is very, very unique uh, and just blends so well together. And not only that, it's also a pretty high ABV beer at 11%. 
So good. If you're a fan of any of those styles of beers, you are going to enjoy this beer. 